Vice Chair Schnock? Here. Chair Stone. Here. Uh, item two, the agenda. Would you approve? Second. There has been a request that uh, we move the closed session, item four, to the end of the meeting. I'll make that motion. Uh, and I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item three, we're now having, going to have a presentation for Ms. Susan Mulligan, who is the general manager of Cayugas Municipal Water District. Her presentation will be on the ocean desalinization project that they've been looking into. Uh, Ms. Mulligan. Thank you, Chair Stonewall. I hear that there's magic that happens when she pushes a button and she all starts. Can they see it okay? Eventually. You gotta wait for all the magic to happen. Are more of them? It's a it's a progression. Is this the clicker? That is the clicker. If everything's going well, it'll start to show up and the lights will dim. desalination in Ventura County. So the staff embarked on a study, and this is the result of that study. Our board hasn't made any decisions about it one way or another, but I thought that um, I could share with you the cost, the benefits, the challenges of implementing a project like that in our county. And uh, Chair Stonewall heard me speak a couple weeks ago on this. I thought it would be helpful for the board. Yes. Ms. Mulligan offered to come to the board and make this presentation, yeah. which we appreciate very much. Okay, so what I'll cover is the problem, why Cayugas would be interested in this, and the alternatives we have. The treatment process, intakes, which is the toughest part of building a seawater desal plant, discharge, energy issues, <coughs> connecting to Cayugas' existing system, permitting, which is also very tough. Cost, what, how long it would take, and then where Cayugas is looking to head from here. So the problem that Cayugas has is we can meet customer demands during short outages, a few weeks, a month of imported supplies. But if you start looking at a seismic event where you have multiple months of outages, we have a real problem meeting supplies, and all of the imported water in this county comes through one tunnel in Simi Valley. So we have a vulnerability. So less than a month, we're fine. More than a month is the challenge. So there are a number of options that could help meet that need. And I just put them up on the screen. I won't read them to you. But there are lots of things that could happen. This particular presentation focused on seawater desalination. Caveat. It's conceptual. We studied it, but we didn't spend millions of dollars on the study. The, the point of the study was to give a general idea of the facilities, cost, challenges, process, schedule, and give our board enough information to decide about next steps. They're based on a slightly larger facility than is likely to be built, but the unit cost would be similar. And obviously, we'd need to do a lot more work to really refine all this. So let's talk about treatment. I have a little video. And because I wasn't sure the audio was going to work, I'm going to read, read the story while the video shows. This is about treatment. So seawater desalination, seawater can both be, 
do better. Seawater can be most economically converted to <coughs> water through a process known as reverse osmosis. The process starts by extracting water from the ocean using wells located on the shoreline or an intake structure located in the open ocean like you see on the screen. To protect the reverse osmosis membranes from becoming clogged by particles suspended in the seawater, first the water is run through multimedia filters with layers of material like sand, anthracite coal, and gravel. In some cases, other types of membranes like ultrafiltration and microfiltration are used, and they do the same process. The next step is to remove even smaller particles. And this other particles from the seawater. In some cases, other types of membranes, known as ultrafiltration and microfiltration membranes, are well, used instead of multimedia filters to pretreat the seawater. Next, the filtered seawater travels to the cartridge filters, which act as a second stage of filtration. Cartridge filters used for seawater reverse osmosis are typically made from a yarn-like synthetic material that is wound into cartridges. These remove even smaller solid particles from the seawater, such as fine sand and clay, before the seawater proceeds to the reverse osmosis membranes. High pressure pumps increase the pressure of the seawater up to 1,000 psi. This is exactly like your The point. pressure needs to be sufficiently high to overcome the naturally occurring osmotic pressure and force water from the saltwater side through the reverse osmosis membranes to the freshwater side. The salt particles in the seawater are rejected from passing through the membrane to the freshwater side and remain behind on the concentrated saltwater side. The reverse osmosis membrane can be thought of as a number of sealed envelopes <coughs> connected at their open ends to a tube. There are spacers between each envelope which allow water to flow across the membrane. The membrane, envelopes, and spacers are then wound around the tube like a roll of paper towels. The reverse osmosis membranes are then enclosed in a fiberglass shell. The membranes are connected end to end, usually six to seven membranes together, and housed in vessels that are built to withstand pressures up to 1200 PSI. As the pressurized seawater enters the pressure vessel and flows across the membrane surface, the water molecules are forced into and through the membrane envelopes, leaving the salt molecules behind. The desalted water passes through the membrane and emerges at low pressure, where it is collected in a tube and directed to one end of the pressure vessel. The concentrated salt stream that is rejected from flowing through the membrane continues to pass across the membrane surface, where it is collected separately. The concentrated salt stream will have about a 60% higher salinity than the incoming seawater. The concentrated salt stream is sent back to the ocean through a device known as a brine outfall. The brine outfall is situated in an area of significant ocean flow so that the salt levels are quickly returned to equilibrium with the ocean. In a properly designed brine outfall, no noticeable increase in salinity can be detected at a distance of a few meters from the discharge. Approximately 40% of the seawater that enters the system is converted to potable water during the reverse osmosis process. The potable water is further treated by adding calcium carbonate to improve the taste and bring the pH to the neutral range. Chlorine is also injected to provide disinfection properties as the water travels from the reverse osmosis plant through the distribution pipes to homes and businesses. So really you more than anyone know exactly what this process is. It is just like your plant, only it's more salt and more pressure and more money. So this is just a schematic of the process on the plant. So this is a seawater desalination plant that just got started up a few months ago in Carlsbad. You've probably read about this in the paper. And it has been operating successfully since then. These are just some pictures of it. Those are the cartridge filters in those, uh, those uh, gray cylindrical things at the back. These are their membranes. It's a little bit bigger than your plant. The energy uh, recovery devices. So for the size of plant that we would be looking at in our county, it would be something pretty similar to the Carlsbad plant. And it would need about 7 to 12 acres, depending on how the layout was. And there are a few considerations for siding the plant. 
One is, what's the best place for the intake and outfall? So the best thing to do is to figure out where you want to put the intake and outfall, how they would be designed, and then figure out where to put the plant. You could put the plant in the coastal zone, which is the part beach, beach side from where that green line is, which reduces the length and cost of your intake and bright discharge pipes. But on the other hand, there's more permitting, social impacts, and questions about seawater rise. If you put it inland from the coastal zone, you don't have the same restrictions that you do in the coastal zone. But on the other hand, you have to build two pipes farther to and from the ocean. So there, there are trade-offs. So the most challenging part of the project, the most challenging from a permitting, construction, operations and maintenance perspective is intakes. The State Water Resources Control Board Ocean Plan says you need to pick the best site, best design, best technology, and best mitigation measures, and this is the important part, to minimize intake and mortality of marine life. That's difficult with a seawater intake, and that's the guideline that you have to follow. The main concern is impingement and entrainment. Impingement is when little marine life gets caught up against the intake and trainment is when they actually get pulled in. So there are a few types of seawater intakes. There are subsurface, which can be wells or infiltration galleries, and I'll talk a little bit about what those are. And then there's open. There's something called a velocity cap, which is just an open pipe with a cap on it. Nobody's building those anymore. People are taking the water in through power plant intakes but power plants aren't going to be allowed in the next few years. They're all going to have to stop taking seawater in for their cooling. So that also is being phased out. And the Carlsbad plant actually uses that, and they're going to have to stop. They're going to have to have another way to take the water in. And then there's wedge wire screens at the bottom right. There's a picture of a wedge wire screen. And the sort of dark part of the sides there is a, is a screen that's very thin and designed so that there are low velocities coming into it to try to minimize taking in the marine life. But I'm going to talk about the subsurface intakes. They are a little bit more complicated, and they are what are preferred by the permitting agencies. So the types of wells, there's beach wells, slant wells, horizontally, directionally drilled wells, and collector wells. The beach wells are simply like any well that you see anywhere in the ag fields out here. They go straight down, they're near the ocean, and they pull in seawater it's a proven technology, but they pull in uh, water from the groundwater basins as well. And that's, that's probably a deal breaker here. We don't want to be pulling water in from the groundwater basins. We want to really be capturing seawater. Another one is slant wells. It's just like the previous well, but you go in at an angle. It's only been done in pilot testing up in Monterey they're doing some pilot testing with it. It's similar to vertical wells, but there's decreased impact to onshore groundwater resources because you're pointing out towards the ocean. But the concern is they really haven't been used in a full-scale application. There's horizontally directionally drilled wells, which is kind of a curved design. So you start in one place and you put pipes out in curves in all directions. There's been some limited use for seawater desal. There are several projects in Spain that have had some staff members volunteer to go see them. Uh, maintenance is probably more difficult because they are curved. It would be hard to get a tool in there and clean them out if you needed to. Collector wells, the last kind of well, is probably the oldest, most reliable technology. It's also called a Rani well. It's used all over the country for collecting water from rivers. And you build a big shaft, and then you have, you, you drill horizontally, and the water just comes in. That second picture shows water coming in from a whole bunch of horizontal wells. So you could put one of those by the, by the shore, and then drill laterally out towards the ocean. You would want to drill inland. So that's, that's a possibility. Infiltration galleries, these are like sand filters in a filtration plant. And you can do it at the seafloor, or you can do it a little closer inland in what's called a beach infiltration gallery. 
It's been, it has limited use. They've used it in Japan. A consideration is you need a very large area to provide the desired supply. The maintenance is tough. These are underneath the seafloor out in the ocean. So if they get clogged or you have a problem, it's very difficult to get to them. Beach infiltrations galleries are very similar. They're considered to be self-cleaning via wave action, but as you well know, our area is susceptible to beach sand erosion and deposition, so these things could be maybe not under the sand after you put them in. So that's a challenge here. This is one in Long Beach, and it actually got exposed. They're actually standing on top of it in that picture. So the geology out here, you know, if you're going to do wells, what's the geology? And you can see the sandy part in the shallow, which is great. We don't have a lot of information, but what we do have from existing wells means that you could probably drill into that sandy part and find uh, and, and be able to operate and pull seawater down. Another possibility is to drill into one of the deeper aquifers, but you don't want to pull in onshore supplies. So one thing that could be considered is Winnemi Canyon. It's like the Grand Canyon in a way because it cuts through all the different layers. So the aquifers, like the Fox Canyon aquifer, actually are exposed at the Winnemi Canyon. It's one reason that seawater intrusion happens kind of in this area. So if you were, could get wells out to the deep aquifers at the edge of that canyon, which might be challenging, you could access seawater that way. So these are some options. Again, we didn't narrow any down, but these are the things that we looked at. Brine discharge is pretty straightforward. It's very similar to the outfall of that Cuyahoga's built for the salinity management pipeline about five years ago. For every gallon of water that you bring in to the plant, half of a gallon goes back out as brought. The video was a little bit off on that. What you have to do is make sure that at a specific distance from your outfall, the seawater isn't too salty and there are rules about how salty it can be. And the way to do that is with diffusers, like you see in the picture. These are from construction of the Outfall 4R Salinity Management Pipeline. There are little uh, rubber flaps that open up and water can go out, but it can't come back in. And they're 30 feet apart, coming off at angles over a distance of about 500 feet on that R outfall that we have. <coughs> so these are some pictures of construction of the outfall five years ago here off of Winnie Beach. And you can see all the pieces of pipe and the little diffusers off of it. And it's working just fine. It's in operation. So how would we connect to Cayuga's existing system? I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. And this is just a theoretical plant in Oxnard. That doesn't mean it needs to be in Oxnard. It's got a, the water coming in from the port of Wanini, going out in a discharge pipe over in the Merlin area. This was just for estimating costs. We haven't cited anything. And the sizes of pipe that would be needed to get it up into Cayuga's system. We'd need to bring it to a reservoir up in Spanish Hills, our Springville Reservoir. But the demands for Oxnard and Port Wainimi aren't all that high. Two-thirds of Cayuga's demands are in the Conejo and Simi Valleys. So that water's got to move a lot farther. So we would have to get it almost to Moore Park, up at the top right under where it says draft, in order to really convey it to the customers who need it. So it's a long way, and it certainly adds cost. And I'll get to that later. So energy is a big concern for seawater desalt plants. It takes a lot of energy to bring water here from the state water project, because it has to be pumped over the Tehachapi's. But it takes even more energy to take salt out of seawater. So it's a concern. And it's the largest single operating cost, and it's controversial. It's, it's something that people bring up when they impose these facilities. Oh, here's the, here's the chart. So it doesn't really matter what the units are, kilowatt hours per million gallons, but you can see way off to the right up top is seawater desalination. Second down is imported state project water. And then brackish groundwater desalination, which is what you operate, is about halfway down. So that uses quite a bit less water than imported. So you can see where it is on the scale. So, Building a plant, we certainly need to implement as many energy saving measures as we can. 
And we would need to develop some kind of renewable energy, energy source, be that locally or someplace else to offset the greenhouse gas impacts. It would take many, many, many acres of solar panels, so it may be best to go do it out in the desert somewhere. Permitting. This is, the, this is a really tough part, and it's probably a 10-year process ahead of building a plant, maybe longer. <clears throat> so the major permits, I'm just going to run through these. There are a lot of things on the slides, and that's really just to give you a flavor of all the things that need to be done, but I'm just going to kind of run through it fast. So you need a drinking water permit from the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water. You need a discharge permit for the outfall. I guess is fairly familiar with that because we did it already for an outfall. You need the state water resource control permit for, for a permit for intake, which is interesting because nobody's gotten one of those yet. And you need a lease from the State Lands Commission, which has jurisdiction of water out in the sea. Oh, and last but not by no means least, California Coastal Commission Coastal Development. So you really need your ducks in a row, planning out your project, working with these permit agencies as you start planning things. Drinking water supply permit amendment, three to four years, and that's all the applicable regulations. And those are all the reports that you have to do. That's one of the easier ones. Permit for discharge. Two to three years could be done in parallel with the previous one. Need to do a bunch of studies and monitoring plans. Again, we're pretty familiar with this, and it's doable. The intake is the challenge. The State Water Resource Control Board just last year adopted a regulation for permitting of intakes, and nobody has gone through that process yet. There are some plants. There's one in um, Huntington Beach, and there's one in El Segundo that are going through this process. And what we do know is that the permits for the intakes, all the studies need to be done with a very public process. These other agencies have gotten panels of experts to do it so you don't have agency staff making the decisions. And again, you've got this best site, best design, minimize intake and mortality of marine life. <coughs> so the default is you need to have a subsurface intake, unless it is absolutely not feasible, not cost effective. And the challenge is all of those subsurface intakes are a lot more expensive than just having an open intake with those screens on it. And it will be interesting to see what these other agencies end up doing when it comes to that. State Lands Commission lease, this is fairly straightforward. It takes two years. It's towards the end of the process. Coastal Commission Coastal Development Permit. This is at least equally or harder to get than the intake permit from State Water Resources Control Board. It's required for both the intake and the discharge facilities. I think the intake will be the more challenging. It takes two to three years and it can't be granted until all the other permits are obtained. Those are all the questions that need to be asked. Things like growth inducement, impingement and entrainment, energy requirements, how you're going to minimize energy, greenhouse gas minimization. What else have you done before you went to the ocean? Have you done all the water conservation, all the brackish water treatment, all the recycled water, all the stormwater capture that you possibly can before you do this? And Santa Barbara is dealing with that, even though they have an old plant, as they're trying to get some approval to continue to operate, these questions are being asked. So that's one reason that sea water desal isn't something that needs to happen tomorrow. We need to do the other things first. I think this county will ultimately get to sea water desal, but we need to work on all the other things first and see where they take us. These are just a bunch of other permits needed. Federal, state, <coughs> some more state permits. Environmental mitigation. The Carlsbad plant has an open intake, and they do take in some fish because they're coming in through a power plant. We'll see if they can continue to do that. And they had to do restoration of 66 acres of wetlands. And so that was part of their project cost. If you have a subsurface intake, you probably don't need to do this, or at least it doesn't need to be anything so substantial. 
So permitting is likely to drive the schedule for the project. We need to talk to the permit agencies early and often. And it needs to be coordinated with public engagement and outreach the whole time in a, in a way that our agency has probably never done before. Needs to, CEQA and NEPA needs to integrate with what the permitting agencies want. And it needs to go in parallel and be part of the design. So you can't design it and then decide to go get the permits, like we do for simple jobs. So what does it cost? I, I Googled to find a big pile of money, and I don't think that pile's a big one. <laughs> so these are conceptual. They don't include in, by any environmental mitigation. They are based on a little bit bigger plant than we would need, and they're based on slant wells. So the total cost, is 2.3 billion to build it. Uh, it's not as much as you would think if you spread the capital out over many years. It's still a lot more than important water, but it's not quite as bad as that number looks initially. The big parts of the cost, uh, the biggest is pumping and conveyance to the Coyotes distribution system. A possibility is your agency could conceivably be a partner in the plant itself and it would need to be pumped to you. Now, if you're, if you're part of a kind of purveyor, you might end up with some of that cost. If you maybe participate directly, maybe there's a way you know, it goes straight to you. San Diego County Water Authority did have two of their member agencies participate directly in a contract for the plant. So that's, that's something that could be considered. Um, the reverse osmosis process itself is a big part of the cost. Intake's a big part, and dealing with front is a big part. Annual operations and maintenance costs, $70 million a year for this particular size of plant. You can see almost half of it is power. And operations and maintenance for the conveyance facility isn't that much. Even though it's being pumped quite a bit, most of the initial costs are pipe. And once a pipe's in the ground, there isn't all that much operation and maintenance cost for it. Overall cost, this is really the bottom line. So you are paying Cayugas about $1,400 an acre foot for water. And the cost of this plant is estimated at about $2,700 to $3,100 per acre foot. Cayugas pays Metropolitan a little bit less for water. We're a little over $1,000 an acre foot right now, maybe about $1,100. And based on different projections, METS rates could increase at 4%, 5%, 6%. Actually, when I put this together, I hadn't seen their latest projections, and they're more like 4% for two years and then 5% after that. So we're probably in that blue section. Well, assuming the cost of seawater desal didn't increase over that time, and it might a little bit with inflation, but it might decrease with improved efficiencies. Say it stayed about the same. You'd be even in 19 years. Well, it's not going to take a whole lot less than that to permit and build a plant like that. If Metropolitan's rates decrease at 4% per year, which I think is unlikely, it would take 28 years before it was a similar cost to imported water. So it's expensive, but it's not as much more than imported water, and particularly as imported water is projected to be as you might think. And it has one big benefit over imported water, which is it's not subject to droughts. So, schedule, conclusions, next steps. We think that probably an optimistic schedule is about 14 years. And um, I, don't, I won't go through all the details, but you see down at the bottom the design right of way and permitting, second to last line is, is a lot of it. And you're doing some design. In, in conjunction with that. So in conclusion, the conclusion Cadigas came to, the cost is very high. The permit agencies and the public are going to expect the greatest environmental protections possible, which are going to create pressure to downsize any plant, make sure we implemented everything else we could. Like I said, evaluating alternative ways to meet our reliability goal. And what our next steps are, we're just finishing up a master plan, and our next step is going to be to perform an evaluation of other projects 
but that list that I put out in the front. How could those meet the goal? So we have a cost now, $3,000 an acre foot. What other projects could be implemented that cost less than $3,000 an acre foot to develop local supplies, to uh, have water available if we have an outage? I think you've, you've looked at a project recently that certainly costs less than $3,000 an acre foot. Uh, we want to talk all these over with our purveyors and potential project partners. And then we can have a laundry list of what most effectively for Cayegas will meet our outage reliability goal, which we aren't at today. Seawater desalination may be, it probably won't be all of the solution. It will probably be part of the solution at some point in the future. The other things that we're going to learn in the next year or two, uh, we're studying some um, issues with our well field on what the long-term production capacity is if we ran for six <coughs> months. We're doing some modeling out there. Uh, we'll know that next year. There'll probably be some big decisions on the Delta Tunnels this year, and we'll have an idea whether those are going to go forward or not. And we'll also see how some of the other two water desal plants are doing with permitting, the Huntington Beach one, the El Segundo one, and the Santa Barbara one, so that we'll have a better feel for what it might take to get through the permitting process. So that's it. Can I answer any questions? Thank you, Susan. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, Chair Stoma, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your presentation. Um, looking at uh, one of the uh, last slides where you have the project schedule, mm -hmm. so your, your chart going through there. Um, where do you see as, as you talked about, $2 billion for the cost? How do you see that rolling out over the over the plan projection? Is there going to be, say, a sizable chunk at the beginning to start? I think, it's I think that the best way to build most of this project is through something like they did at Carlsbad. Uh, we've talked about how, if Cayus built this, would we finance it? And we don't have the bonding capacity, nor would we ever, for something this big. We would have the bonding capacity to build the connection pipelines. Uh, what, what they did in San Diego was something called a P3. It's a public-private partnership. And it's a public agency and a private entity, and the private entity comes up with the capital to build it. And they negotiate with the public agency for a price for the water. And I think that in order to avoid having, and of course they get some kind of profit through that, but it avoids us having a big spike in rates in order to get the capital to build the project up front. And I think overall that makes some sense. Uh, the, the company that did the work at the site is very experienced with this. The, it, they've built uh, plants in Israel that are similar. So Caigas has never done a P3 before, but I think, especially from a finance perspective, it's probably the way to do it. Huntington Beach is looking at that method too. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Director Sharkey. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, the big example we have locally here, of course, is Carlsbad. Mm -hmm. And every presentation I've seen on Carlsbad emphasizes the uh, uh, the number of various components that all had to come together in just the right way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Not the least of which was, was the reclamation recycling component. Um, as we look here locally, we're all very much aware of the situation of the Oxnard wastewater treatment plant. And uh, you know, I like to see these, you know, being the optimist that I am, I like to see these things as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but setting aside for a moment the, uh, the difficulty with getting anything done with the city of Oxnard. Uh, if we're looking far enough out on the horizon, to me that seems like an important uh, component that you know, recycled water is going to be more and more important for all of us. So, um, you know, I'm not giving anything away, but I've been looking at, at uh, working with, uh, with Oxnard and, and uh, uh, you know, maybe there's a way if you look at the, they're, 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 what they're going to have to spend and the kind of plant they're going to have to build, I mean, is there a possibility for some kind of symbiosis here that uh, uh, you know, we can put together a, a better project 
that would spread the cost out uh, over a greater base? Yes, I think there is. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> I think there is. Your city public works director and I meet with Oxnard every every month and keep the channels of communication open. I think they're starting to fill some key positions. Uh, United Water Conservation District has a new general manager who I think is very motivated and interested in finding water. So um, we've been talking about how pipes might be connected, how that water might be delivered through existing pipes to get to some people who need water in this county. So I think that's the low-hanging fruit. And I think an Oxnard wants to do it too. They've just had so many challenges. Yeah. They haven't been able to do it. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's just a tremendous opportunity. I'd be ashamed to miss this, but uh, you know, things happen. And, uh, it needs to happen before this does. Oh, well, yeah, no question. They're, they're on a, <coughs> they're looking at the kind of a timeline they're going to have to meet somehow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but if it's all planned out, you know, looking looking forward to what we're going to need to do to provide water for this county, it, 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 I, I, it just really frustrates me no end. That it's just so difficult to uh, to get even talking together about this. I'm optimistic that things are changing. Uh, we'll great, see. thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I had just had, this is probably an engineering question, but you you indicated that most of the water that you would be using goes to the over the hill into uh, the Paneo Valley, mm -hmm. and one of the big costs is locating the plant near the coast if you do that. So if you have to build that infrastructure anyway, couldn't you locate the plant inland and use the money that you're going to use to transport the water over the hill to just transport salt water over the hill? I wish we could. The challenge is you have to build two pipes. The further inland you go, because you have to build a pipe to the plant from the ocean to get take the water in, and you have to build a pipe from the plant to the ocean to take the brine out. So the farther away from the ocean you are, the further distance you have to build the two pipes. That's the challenge. So your current you know, these are big, that's, big ditches. <laughs> needless to say, your current SMP line would be out of the question, correct? It's it's got it's being used for other things. Huh? It is, and the outfall's too small. We looked at it, and the outfall's just way too small. I figured you did, but I thought I'd ask a question. Lots of it. You're not the first one I've asked. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for listening. Thank you for your interest. Oh, thank you for coming, Susan. Okay, we are now, uh, we have moved item four to the end of the agenda, so the next item of business is five. The approval of the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Cash disbursements, item B. Second. You want me to read it? What? Sure. Yes, sir. No. I mean, I'm sure there's two people in the audience okay, here. Yeah. It is recommended the board ratify the cash disbursements listing for the period January 29th, 2016 through February 26, 2016. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item C, Brackish Water Reclamation Demonstration Facility Operational Performance. Is, no one has any, oh, no one's here. Well, Mr. Hickox is uh, not with us today, so in his, in his um, place, Mr. Burrell will answer any questions. No, just joking now. <laughs> He's here for finance stuff. I'll try to answer any questions there may be. I will note that the plant still isn't running. Uh, that's probably the most uh, interesting thing or uh, a disappointing thing, but the plant still isn't running because of the high silt density index. And if there are any questions that you have, I might try to answer them if they're operational. Is there questions. any indication on it may, you may be able to come back online? St it's still pretty high right now, uh, so I wouldn't remain optimistic that any time in the next month or in the next several months. And as we head toward uh, higher demand times with higher heat, uh, it's more, it's just less likely that uh, we're going to have uh, uh, a lower demand events, which, which would be one reason we might be able to start uh, using the other 
well again. So I'm not optimistic anytime soon. So last week's rainfall was no resistance. I heard it filled a lot of reservoirs in some places of the state, but I don't think it got into our spreading ground as much. All right, there in El Rio. Okay. Sure. Yes. Rich, was there a special or additional maintenance cost of uh, something that might maintenance that may have to be performed on the membranes when they sit idle like that? Y yes, but nothing. Uh, it's not an extra cost. We do. We do maintain the, uh, the membranes and keep their viability during this time. Okay, water demand reduction update. Okay. Okay. This was uh, this was a question that came up kind of at the last meeting, and basically this is the this is an update of the two components of water which PHWA itself uses, not the city's, not the city or the beach district or the navy. And, uh, it has, they also have particular requirements from, uh, from the state. Um, but this, these are the requirements that the PHWA is under. And the first one is the uh, emergency ordinance for the, for the groundwater. Of course, roughly 80% of our water in the past has come from groundwater. And the emergency ordinance, if you recall, was where over an 18 month period, the uh, demand had to be reduced by uh, to, to a total of 20 percent in 10, then 15, and then 20 percent um, total um, over that period. And um, the baseline was established as a 10 year period. And you can see from the chart on the second page of the uh, report that PHWA has met the uh, reduction requirements each time. And so our requirement to be 20%, we're still, we're, our reduction is still 26%. So we're doing fine under emergency ordinance C. And then as far as the surface water, this is the state water that we get from Cayagas, which is basically the metropolitan water. And we are really lumped in with Oxnard on this because that's where the water comes to us through Oxnard. But um, we extracted the part of it that we're required to do at one point. Cayagas helped us pull that figure out, and our reduction is really only 5.6%. 5, 5 and the overall reduction, I'm mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, 